Where the Red Fern Grows Chapter 12 The fame of my dogs spread all over our part of the Ozarks. They were the best in the country. No coon hunter came into my grandfather's store with as many pelts as I did. Grandpa never overlooked an opportunity to brag. He told everyone the story of my dogs and the part he played in getting them. Many was the time some farmer came to our home, would say, your grandpa was telling me you got three big coons over in Pea Valley Hollow the other night. I would listen, knowing I only got one or maybe none, but grandpa was my pal. If he said I caught ten in one tree, it was just that way. Because of my grandfather's bragging and his firm belief in my dogs and me, a terrible thing happened. One morning while having breakfast, Mama said to Papa, I'm almost out of cornmeal. Do you think you can go to the mill today? Papa said, I intended to butcher a hog. We're about out of meat. Looking at me, he said, shell a sack of corn. Take one of the mules and go to the mill for your mother. With the help of my sisters, we shelled the corn. Throwing it over the mule's back, I started for the store. On arriving at the mill house, I tied my mule to the hitching post took my corn, and set it by the door. I walked over to the store and told Grandpa I wanted to get some corn ground. He said, I'll be with you in just a minute. As I was waiting, I heard a horse coming. Looking out, I saw who it was, and I didn't like what I saw. It was the two youngest Pritchard boys. I had run into them on several occasions during pie suppers and dances. The Pritchards were a large family that lived upriver about five miles. As in most small country communities, there's one family that no one likes. The Pritchards were it. Tales were told that they were bootleggers, thieves, and just all around no accounts. The story had gone around that old man Pritchard had killed a man somewhere in Missouri before moving into our part of the country. Reuben was two years younger than I big and husky for his age. He never had much to say. He had mean-looking eyes that were set far back in his rugged face. They were smoky-hued and unblinking, as if the eyelids were paralyzed. I'd heard that once he cut a boy with a knife in a fight over at the sawmill. Rainey was the youngest about my age. He had the meanest disposition of any boy I'd ever known. Because of this, he was disliked by young and old. Wherever Rainy went, trouble seemed to follow. He was always wanting to bet and would bet on anything. He was nervous and could never seem to stand still. Once in my grandfather's store, I had given him a piece of candy. Snatching it out of my hand, he ate it and then sneered at me and said it wasn't any good. During a pie supper one night, he wanted to bet a dime that he could whip me. My mother told me always be kind to Rainey, that he couldn't help being the way he was. I asked why. She said it was because his brothers were always picking on him and beating him. On entering the store, they stopped and glared at me. Reuben walked over to the counter. Rainey came over to me. Leering at me, he said, I'd like to make a bet with you. I told him I didn't want to bet. He asked if I was scared. No, I just don't want to bet, I said. His neck and ears looked as though he hadn't been washed in months. His ferret-like eyes kept darting here and there. Glancing down to his hands, I saw the back of his right sleeve was stiff and starchy from the constant wiping of his nose. He saw I was looking him over and asked if I liked what I saw. I started to say no, but I didn't, turned and walked away a few steps. Reuben ordered some chewing tobacco. Aren't you a little young to be chewing? Grandpa asked. Ain't for me, it's for my dad, Reuben growled. Grandpa handed two plugs to him. He paid for it, turned around, and handed one plug to Rainey. Holding the other up in front of him, he looked it over. Looking at Grandpa, he gnawed at one corner of it. Grandpa mumbled about how some kids were brought up these days. He came from behind the counter saying to me, let's go grind that corn. The Pritchard boys made no move to follow us out of the store. 
Come on, Grandpa said. I'm going to lock up till I get this corn ground. We'll stay here. I want to look at some of the shirts, said Reuben. No, you won't, said Grandpa. Come on, I'm going to lock up. Begrudgingly, they walked out. I helped Grandpa start the mill, and we proceeded to grind the corn. The Pritchard boys had followed us and were standing looking on. Rainey walked over to me. I hear you have some good hounds, he said. I told him I had the best in the country. If he didn't believe me, he could just ask my grandfather. He just leered at me. I don't think they're half as good as you say they are, he said. Bet our old blue tick hound can outhunt both of them. I laughed. Ask Grandpa who brings in the most hides. I wouldn't believe him. He's crooked, he said. I let him know right quick that my grandfather wasn't crooked. He's a storekeeper, ain't he? I glanced over at Grandpa. He'd heard the remark made by Rainey. His friendly old face was as red as a turkey gobbler's waddle. The last of my corn was just going through the grinding stones. Grandpa pushed a lever to one side, shutting off the power. He came over and said to Rainey, What do you do? Just go around looking for trouble? What do you want? A fight? Reuben sidled over. This ain't none of your business, he said. Besides, Rainey's not looking for a fight. We just want to make a bet with him. Grandpa glared at Reuben. Any bet you would make sure would be a good one, all right. What kind of bet? Reuben spat a mouthful of tobacco juice on the clean floor. He said, well, we've heard so much about them hounds of his. We just think it's a lot of talk and lies. We'd like to make a little bet, say about two dollars. I'd never seen my grandfather so mad. The red had left his face, and its place was a sickly, paste gray color. The kind old eyes behind the glasses burned with a fire I'd never seen. In a loud voice, he asked, bet on what? Reuben spat again. Grandpa's eyes followed the brown stain in its arch until it landed on the clean floor and splattered. With a leering grin on his ugly, dirty face, Reuben said, Well, we got an old coon up in our part of the country that's been there a long time. Ain't no dog yet ever been smart enough to tree him. And I, Rainey broke into the conversation. He ain't just an ordinary coon. He's an old timer. Folks call him the ghost coon. Believe me, he is a ghost. He just runs hounds long enough to get them all warmed up, then climbs a tree and disappears. Our old blue hound has treated him more times than Reuben told Rainey to shut up and let him do the talking. Looking over at me, he said, what do you say? Want to bet two dollars your hounds can tree him? I looked at my grandfather, but he didn't help me. I told Reuben I didn't want to bet, but I was pretty sure my dogs could tree the ghost coon. Rainy butted in again. What's the matter, you yellow? I felt the hot blood rush into my face. My stomach felt like something alive was crawling in it. I doubled up my right fist and was to the point of hitting Rainy in one of his eyes when I felt my grandfather's hand on my shoulder. I looked up. His eyes flashed as he looked at me. A strange little smile was tugging at the corner of his mouth. The big artery in his neck was pounding out and in. He reminded me of a young bird that had fallen out of a nest and lay dying on the ground. Still looking at me, he reached back and took his billfold from his pocket, saying, I'm going to let him call your bet, but now you listen. If you boys take him up there to hunt the ghost coon and jump on him and beat him, you're sure going to hear from me. I don't mean maybe. I'll have you both taken to Tahlequah and put in jail. You better believe that. Reuben saw he had pushed my grandfather far enough. Backing up a couple of steps, he said, We're not going to jump him. All we want to do is make a bet. Grandpa handed me two $1 bills, saying to Reuben, You hold your money, and he can hold his. If you lose... You better pay off. Looking back to me, he said, Son, 
If you lose, pay off. I nodded my head. I asked Reuben when he wanted me to come up for the hunt. He thought a minute. You know where that old log slide comes out from the hills onto the road? He asked. I nodded. We'll meet you there tomorrow night about dark, he said. It was fine with me, I said, but I told him not to bring his hounds because mine wouldn't hunt with other dogs. He said he wouldn't. I agreed to bring my axe and lantern. As they turned to leave, Rainey sneered, Sucker, he said. I made no reply. After the Pritchard boys had gone, Grandfather looked at me and said, Son, I've never asked another man for much, but I sure want you to catch the ghost coon. I told him if the ghost coon made one track in the river bottom, my dogs would get him. Grandpa laughed. You'd better be getting home. It's getting late and your mother is waiting for the cornmeal, he said. I could hear him chuckling as he walked toward his store. I thought to myself, there goes the best grandpa a boy ever had. Lifting the sack of meal to the back of my old mule, I started for home. All the way I kept thinking of old Dan, little Ann, ghost coons, and the two ugly, dirty Pritchard boys. I decided not to tell my mother and father anything about the hunt, for I knew Mama wouldn't approve of anything I had to do with the Pritchards. The following evening, I arrived at the designated spot early. I sat down by a red oak tree to wait. I called little Ann over to me and had a good talk with her. I told her how much I loved her, scratched her back, and looked at the pads of her feet. Sweetheart, I said, you must do something for me tonight. I want you to tree the ghost coon, for it means so much to Grandpa and me. She seemed to understand and answered by washing my face and hands. I tried to talk to old Dan, but I may as well have talked to a stump for all the attention he paid to me. He kept walking around, sniffing here and there. He couldn't understand why we were waiting. He was wanting to hunt. Reuben and Rainey showed up just at dark. Both had sneers on their faces. Are you ready? Reuben asked. Yes, I said, and asked him which way was the best to go. Let's go down river away and work up, he said. We're sure to strike him coming up river, and that way we've got the wind in our favor. Are these the hounds that we've been hearing so much about? Rainey asked. I nodded. They look too little to be any good, he said. I told him dynamite came in little packages. He asked me if I had my two dollars. Yes, I said. He wanted to see my money. I showed it to him. Reuben, not to be outdone, showed me his. We crossed an old field and entered the river bottoms. By this time, it was quite dark. I lit my lantern and asked which one wanted to carry my axe. It's yours, Rainey said. You carry it. Not wanting to argue, I carried both the lantern and the axe. Rainey started telling me how stingy and crooked my grandfather was. I told him I hadn't come to have any trouble or to fight. All I wanted to do was hunt the ghost coon. If there was going to be any trouble, I would just call my dogs and go home. Reuben had a nickel's worth of sense, but Rainey had none at all. Reuben told him if he didn't shut up, he was going to bloody his nose. That shut Rainey up. Old Dan opened up first. It was a beautiful thing to hear. The deep tones of his voice rolled in the silent night. A bird in a cane break on our right started chirping. A big swamp rabbit came running down the river bank as if all hell was close to his heels. A bunch of mallards feeding in the shallows across the river took flight with frightened quacks. A feeling only a hunter knows slowly crept over my body. I whooped to my dogs, urging them on. Little Anne came in, her bell-like tones blended with old Dan's in perfect rhythm. We stood and listened to the beautiful music, the deep-throated notes of hunting hounds on the hot-scented trail of a river coon. Reuben said, if he crosses the river up at Buck Ford, it's the ghost coon, as that's the way he always runs. We stood and listened. Sure enough, the voices of my dogs were silent for a few minutes. Old Dan, a more powerful swimmer than little Ann, was the first to open up after crossing over. She was close behind him. Reuben said, that's him, all right. That's the ghost coon. They crossed the river again. We waited. Rainey said, you may as well get your money out now. I told him just to wait a while, and I'd show him the ghost coon's hide. 
This brought a loud laugh from Rainy, which sounded like someone had dropped an empty bucket on a gravel bar and then had kicked it. The wily old coon crossed the river several times, but couldn't shake my dogs from his trail. He cut out from the bottoms, walked a rail fence, and jumped from it into a thick cane break. He piled into an old slough. Where it emptied into the river, he swam to the middle. Doing opposite to what most coons do, which is swim downstream, he swam upstream. He stopped in an old drift in the middle of it. Little Ann found him. When she jumped him from the drift, old Dan was far downriver searching for the trail. If he could have gotten there in time, it would have been the last of the ghost coon. But little Ann couldn't do much by herself in the water. He fought his way free from her, swam to our side, and ran upstream. I could hear old Dan coming through the bottoms on the other side, bawling at every jump. I could feel the driving power in his voice. We heard him when he hit the water to cross over. It sounded like a cow had jumped in. Little Ann was warming up the ghost coon. I could tell by her voice that she was close to him. Reaching our side, old Dan tore out after her. He was a mad hound. His deep voice was telling her he was coming. We were trotting along, following my dogs, when I heard little Ann's bawling stop. Wait a minute, I said. I think she has treed him. Let's give her time to circle the tree to make sure he's there. Old Dan opened up bawling treed. Reuben started on. Something's wrong, I said. I can't hear little Ann. Rainy spoke up. Maybe the ghost coon ate her up. I glared at him. Hurrying on, we came to my dogs. Old Dan was bawling at a hole in a large sycamore that had fallen into the river. At that spot, the bank was a good ten feet above the water level. As the big tree had fallen, the roots had been torn and twisted from the ground. The jagged roots, acting as a drag, had stopped it from falling all the way into the stream. The trunk lay on a steep slant from the top of the bank to the water. Looking down, I could see the broken, tangled mess of the top. Debris from floods had caught in the limbs, forming a drift. Old Dan was trying to dig and gnaw his way into the log. Pulling him from the hole, I held my lantern up and looked down into the dark hollow. I knew that somewhere down below the surface, there had to be another hole in the trunk, as water had filled the hollow to the river level. Reuben, looking over my shoulder, said, That coon couldn't be in there. If he was, he'd be drowned. I agreed. Rainy spoke up. You ready to pay off, he asked. I told you them hounds couldn't tree the ghost coon. I told him the show wasn't over. Little Ann had never bawled treed, and I knew she wouldn't until she knew exactly where the coon was. Working the bank up and down and not finding the trail, she swam across the river and worked the other side. For a good half hour, she searched that side before she came back across to where old Dan was. She sniffed around the hollow log. We might as well get away from here, Rainy said. They ain't going to find the ghost coon. Sure looks that way, Reuben said. I told him I wasn't giving up till my dogs did. You just want to be stubborn, Reuben said. I'm ready for my money now. I asked him to wait a few minutes. Ain't no use, he said. No hound yet ever treed that ghost coon. Hearing a whine, I turned around. Little Ann had crawled up on the log and was inching her way down the slick trunk toward the water. I held my lantern up so I could see better. Spraddle-legged, claws digging into the bark, she was easing her way down. You'd better get her out of there, Reuben said. If she gets down in that old treetop, she'll drown. Reuben didn't know my little Ann. Once her feet slipped, I saw her hindquarters fall off to one side. She didn't get scared. Slowly, she eased her legs back up on the log. Again, Reuben said, you'd better get her out of there. I made no reply. I just watched and waited. Little Ann eased herself into the water. Swimming to the drift, she started sniffing around. In places, it was thin and her legs would break through. Climbing, clawing, and swimming, she searched the drift over, looking for the lost trail. I saw when she stopped searching. With her body half in the water and her front feet curved over a piece of driftwood, she turned her head and looked toward the shore. I could see her head twisting from side to side. 
I could tell by her actions that she'd gotten the scent. With a low whine, she started back. I told Reuben, I think she smells something. Slowly and carefully, she worked her way through the tangled mass. I lost sight of her when she came close to the undermined bank. She wormed her way under the overhang. I could hear her clawing and wallowing around. Then all hell broke loose. Out from under the bank came the biggest coon I'd ever seen, the ghost coon. He came right over little Anne. She caught him in the old treetop. I knew she was no match for him in that tangled mass of limbs and logs. He fought his way free and swam for the opposite bank. She was right behind him. Old Dan didn't wait, look, or listen. He piled off the 10-foot bank and disappeared from sight. I looked for him. I knew he was tangled in the debris under the surface. I started to take off my overalls, but stopped when I saw his red head shoot out of the water. Bawling and clawing his way free of the limbs and logs, he was on his way. On reaching midstream, the ghost coon headed downriver with little Ann still on his trail. We ran down the river bank. I could see my dogs clearly in the moonlight. The ghost coon was about 15 feet ahead of little Ann. About 25 yards behind them came old Dan, trying so hard to catch up. I whooped to them. Reuben grabbed a pole saying, he may come out on this side. Knowing the ghost coon was desperate, I wondered what he would do. Reaching a gravel bar below the high bank, we ran out on it to the water's edge. Then the ghost coon did something that I never expected. Coming even with us, he turned from midstream and came straight for us. I heard Reuben yell, here he comes. He turned his way through the shallows and ran right between us. Reuben swung his pole, missed the coon and almost hit little Ann. The coon headed for the river bottoms with her right on his heels. The bawling of little Ann and our screaming and hollering made so much noise. I didn't hear old Dan coming. He tore out of the river, plowed into me, and knocked me down. We ran through the bottoms following my dogs. I thought the ghost coon was going back to the sycamore log, but he didn't. He ran upriver. While hurrying after them, I looked over at Rainy. For once in his life, I think he was excited. He was whooping and screaming and falling over logs and limbs. I felt good all over. Glancing over at me, Rainy said, They ain't got him yet. The ghost croon crossed the river time after time. Seeing that he couldn't shake old Dan and little Ann from his trail, he cut through the river bottoms and ran out into an old field. At this maneuver, Reuben said to Rainey, he's heading for that tree. What tree, I asked. You'll see, Rainey said. When he gets tired, he always heads for that tree. That's where he gets his name, the ghost coon. He just disappears. If he disappears, my dogs will disappear with him, I said. Rainey laughed. I had to admit one thing. The Pritchard boys knew the habits of the ghost coon. I knew he couldn't run all night. He'd already far surpassed any coon I'd ever chased. They're just about there, Reuben said. Just then I heard old Dan bark treed. I waited for little Ann's voice. I didn't hear her. I wondered what it could be this time. He's there, all right, Reuben said. He's in that tree. Well, come on, I said. I want to see that tree. You might as well get your money out, Rainy said. I told him. He had said that once before, back on the riverbank.